Okay. How and why the U.S. cannot recover? Is the U.S. a failed state? This is our uh, lecture for today. And I'm Betsy Bowman, uh, your host for today's program. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with us, the Center for Global Justice, or in Spanish, El Centro para la Justicia Global, is a multinational and bilingual research center located in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, in the center of Mexico. The center is devoted to research and learning for a better world and for empowering a solidarity economy. Due to the pandemic, we have discontinued our in-person events and we've instituted online webinars. Without our previous revenue generating programs, we now depend on your donations to support these webinars and to be able to continue to pay our Mexican staff. You can donate at our website, which is www.globaljusticecenter.org. Today is the 84th webinar in our series. Um, today's program is how and why the US cannot recover and is it a failed state? We are pleased to have as our guest speaker, Professor Michael Hudson. Professor Michael Hudson identifies himself more as a classical economist like Adam Smith than anything else. He, in his major work, Super Imperialism, The Economic Strategy of American Empire, just out in its third edition, he describes the outflow of US dollars to non-US producers, you know, all the countries that we people in the US buy from, as in effect, once the dollars have gone out for the purchase of goods, they are then returned to the US Treasury as foreign central banks um, who are holding all of these US dollars from purchases made with US dollars to buy US treasury bills and bonds with all these excess dollars. Foreign countries hold these US treasury bills and bonds as reserves. It also allows the US to spend these monies that go out, come back on yet more military goods, thus encircling the so-called enemy countries such as China and using their own money to do it. And they are actually quite aware of this, even though most Americans are not. China, Russia, and other countries are moving to de-dollarize their economies. Unlike most economists, Hudson emphasizes uh, two things that are very important. The dangers to an economy of exceptional, exponentially growing debt, the role of debt in an economy and the difference between earned and unearned income. Unearned income, such as the income that hedge fund managers and CEOs, the, when they make billions of dollars a year, obviously they're not earning that by working. He would tax away what he calls rentier wealth from unearned income. And he sees the um, world conflict today as being between industrial capitalism and a low cost economy versus what we have in under neoliberalism, finance capitalism with monopoly profits going to the rentier class. So those are two of the most important uh, uh, novel additions of his thought to uh, economic theory. Um, professor Hudson is Distinguished Research Professor of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He also lectures at Hong Kong's Global University for Sustainability and is uh, 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 very uh, involved with the 
um, Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends. Many interviews of him are available on YouTube and I do encourage our uh, public to uh, just go to YouTube and type in Michael Hudson and uh, enjoy some of his interviews. They're most, Michael is most provocative and thought, uh, th thoughtful and thought provoking. And today's program should be quite uh, stimulating and I know we'll have a great discussion afterwards. So thank you very much, Michael, you're on. Okay, well, when we're talking about a failed state, what we're really talking about is a failed economy. Uh, and as uh, you summarized uh, my book, Super Imperialism, very well, uh, the problem is how does a fail economy survive? Well, if it can't produce uh, an economic surplus within, it has to exploit it from other countries. That's the essence. And uh, uh, basically, uh, it's that need to exploit it from other countries that has set uh, the United States in a huge, as you've been reading, geopolitical fight today at the United States against America's two major enemies, Europe, uh, continental Europe, led by England and Germany, and Japan and Korea. These are its satellites. And the fight today that uh, the newspaper uh, represents as being between America on the one hand and China and Russia on the other uh, are not really against China or Russia at all. They're uh, an attempt to keep uh, Europe and uh, uh, East Asia, uh, Japan in the US orbit so that the United States can continue to draw from these countries through the dollar standard, through trade preferences, through uh, US investment, uh, the economic surplus that it's no longer producing at home. This is exactly what the Roman Empire did, which uh, while it was impoverishing its domestic economy by expropriating uh, the citizens who were the old uh, uh, fighter army uh, and hiring mercenaries, uh, it had to conquer uh, Asia Minor and uh, uh, much of Europe, uh, Gaul, in order to uh, obtain the gold and the money to hire the mercenaries to basically subdue uh, the rest of the empire with uh, East Africa being uh, 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 the source of most grain and uh, uh, bringing feudalism very early on by the fourth century to East Africa. Well, that's the big picture. Uh, I'm gonna begin by breaking it down into parts. Uh, politically, as I'm sure you must have known, the United States is paralyzed because of the Senate filibuster. Uh, the American uh, voters are pretty much divided between two branches of the same Wall Street party, the Republicans and the Democrats. And as long as they're each fighting for which party gets to carry out uh, the uh, economics of finance capitalism, uh, there's uh, basically nothing that can be done. And in the absence of Congress, being able to pass laws, the lawmaking process is passed to the Supreme Court, which has been uh, ignored by uh, the Democratic Party and uh, is passed into uh, extremely right-wing uh, groupings sponsored by the Republicans who put in justices who were not only rewriting the American Constitution, but restructuring the American economy to exclude the government from any ability to check the rentier interests. And by the rentier interests, I mean mainly the fire sector, finance on Wall Street, insurance, health insurance, and uh, uh, the financial uh, insurance uh, companies, and uh, real estate. And there's a symbiosis between uh, uh, finance and real estate to the point where uh, today up to 43% uh, of the average income of uh, uh, America, most Americans uh, can be pledged uh, for mortgages to buy housing. If you want to obtain housing today, you have to go to a bank and, how, uh, and the bank uh, finds its major market. 80% of the commercial bank loans in this country, as in England and parts of Europe, are for real estate. So the excess price for housing is 43% of your income. Uh, about 10% uh, of the paycheck of Americans is taken off the top, uh, is wage withholding to pay for social security and uh, uh, 
medical care. Uh, the social security money is basically spent on the military budget, uh, which is responsible for most of the deficit. So uh, America's medical spending for social security and medical care uh, finances uh, the military deficit. Uh, and uh, over and above that, Americans have to have uh, private health insurance that are paid partly by their employers. Uh, and uh, then they have to pay debt service uh, to uh, the uh, credit card companies, uh, to the banks for non-mortgage loans, for their uh, uh, automobile loans in order to get to work, to get a paycheck. And uh, they, uh, on top of all that, they have to pay taxes. So the result of all of this uh, payment to the uh, fire sector, uh, uh, the, to the government, uh, the taxes, uh, labor, and uh, but not uh, finance capital or real estate, which are exempt from the uh, uh, income tax, largely. Uh, the result is that there's not enough money to uh, buy goods and services, uh, and. The result is that America's deindustrialized. Uh, the deindustrialization really began with the uh, neoliberal pro Wall Street policies of uh, the Reagan and Bush administration, but it was really the, uh, uh, the Democratic uh, administration of uh, uh, the Clintons that uh, began with NAFTA and uh, culminated in uh, inviting China into the World Trade Organization in order to say, uh, in order to really uh, lock in the class war in America by saying, We're, we have much too high priced labor uh, in the United States. It's unionized, it's high priced. The way to uh, reduce the uh, labor uh, wages is to move, move abroad to low wage countries. The idea in, uh, at the end of the Clinton administration was to use uh, China in the same way that President Carter had begun to use uh, Mexico uh, uh, with low priced immigration and uh, NAFTA using even more uh, Mexican low priced labor. Uh, basically, the whole international arrangements, uh, trade arrangements with uh, uh, Mexico, Canada, and China were intended to uh, shift industry out of the United States in order to lower uh, the cost of production and labor. Now, in the process, America deindustrialized, and this has been portrayed as a step forward, as a step of raising GDP. Uh, but if you look at all these GDP statistics that are just coming out now, uh, they're not really the uh, kind of output that the classical economists were talking about. Uh, when they were talking about uh, GDP, it's supposed to be product and you're thinking of something that's produced, the goods and service that you actually use and has some utility. Well, the largest 8% uh, of America's GDP is uh, what homeowners uh, report as what they would pay for their homes if they uh, had to treat themselves as landlords and uh, if they were tenants, what would they have to pay? So as there's been a, a vast, uh, increase in uh, rental uh, income, a vast decline in uh, home ownership since the Obama administration's uh, depression, uh, depression in 2008, uh, the bailout the, uh, that essentially led to a foreclosure on um, up to 10 million American families, mainly uh, black and Hispanic uh, low-income families, the Democratic Party's constituency, uh, the, uh, the home ownership rate dropped and the place has been taken over by uh, large Wall Street uh, investment uh, companies buying out uh, housing and uh, turning it from owner occupied housing into rental housing. Well, all of this has, uh, uh, is counted as an increase in GDP when the, uh, there's a shift from owner occupancy to rental housing uh, and the prices increase because of higher bank loans, that's an increase in GDP. Now, as people become more strapped in order to pay for their housing, in order to pay for their uh, uh, debt service, uh, they fall behind and uh, they, uh, their penalty rates go up from uh, the normal credit card rate of say 11% up to 29%. And when I called the uh, st statisticians that are in charge of the national income and product accounts, I say, where do all these late fees and higher penalties 
uh, appear in the national income accounts. And they said, oh, that's called uh, financial services. So the uh, financial services that are produced are the producing the service of charging the late fees that have uh, increased uh, uh, the amount of uh, debt service that America pays. So uh, the result is uh, a debt strapped economy. And uh, in my book, uh, Killing the Host, I describe uh, the phenomenon of debt deflation. The United States, very much like the Roman economy, has been strapped uh, by uh, by debt and the uh, the income that is supposed to be paid in the circle and the economic textbooks of workers earning an income and going and buying the goods and services they produce in a kind of uh, a circular flow that Henry Ford talked about uh, is now in, uh, siphoned off by payments again to the uh, real estate sector for uh, finance, real estate, and uh, uh, for the in insurance charges that in other countries are public services and human rights. Uh, what the United States economy has done that have made it, made it a failed economy is that it's turned basic human rights, basic needs like shelter, land ownership, a home, medical care, uh, pensions from human rights into financial commodities to make uh, money uh, off of. And, uh, this uh, commodification is uh, the key to neoliberalism and it's uh, eroding the economy and destroying it. Well, the question is, uh, how can an economy survive and actually dominate uh, the world in the way that America is dominating the world militarily and diplomatically today if it doesn't have the economic power and even the military power uh, to uh, actually enforce this kind of dominance. And the explanation for this goes back to uh, how America created its economic empire uh, 80 years ago uh, during World War II, starting with a lend-lease lending to England, uh, followed up by the British loan of uh, 1944, 1945. Uh, the uh, objective in fighting World War II from the United States was how do we come out of the war uh, dominating our allies, just as uh, America had dominated the allies after World War I with the inter-allied debts. Well, the solution was to write into the uh, British loans and into Lend-Lease lend that for one thing, uh, England had to open up its sterling area, all of the block sterling balances, at that time about $10 billion, which was real money held by uh, India and uh, uh, other uh, English colonies that had uh, essentially made uh, accumulated vast amounts of saving during World War II by providing material, raw materials and uh, uh, other uh, goods and services to the Allied war effort. The, uh, these um, sterling balances were at the time blocked for spending only in England. America said, no, you can't have uh, sterling balances and uh, th uh, that are blocked. Uh, they can be spent anywhere. And the only country that was able to actually provide goods and services to the rest of the world at uh, 1945 and six to 1950 was the United States. America also set as a term for England uh, that you cannot devalue sterling to make your economy more competitive. You must never ever uh, develop an industrial power able to rival American uh, industry, American manufacturing. And uh, England uh, uh, agreed to this. Uh, in my new edition of Super Imperialism, I described how the House of Lords uh, saw this and uh, but said, we don't have any choice. We have to essentially become uh, an American satellite. Well, once America had got uh, England to surrender, it was easy to get France and the other allies uh, to join, and then uh, Germany uh, once it was defeated. And uh, the surrender was uh, uh, cloaked in the form of uh, international institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank primarily. Uh, of these, uh, the World Bank has turned out to be uh, uh, just as evil as the International Monetary Fund. Its basic premise was to promote agriculture in America by blocking uh, food production in Latin America and uh, 
uh, Asia and uh, other uh, areas. And uh, loans were made only for the export industries of uh, countries. Uh, loans were only made in foreign currency and the condition was that the countries uh, accepting World Bank credit had to be able to uh, export goods not in competition with those of the United States. They could export plantation crops uh, and the government would borrow from the World Bank to build infrastructure of ports and uh, 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 roads uh, in order to uh, export plantation crops, raw materials that America needed, but uh, didn't produce itself. Uh, the International uh, Monetary Fund uh, was called in at the point where this failed development strategy, uh, a strategy intended to cause an oversupply of goods that the global south produces uh, and keep the global, global south in a chronic balance of payments deficit so that uh, it, in order to maintain the value of its currency, in order to maintain what it, it, the, what it received from its trade, uh, it had to submit to chronic austerity, which is basically uh, an anti-labor program, such as uh, the United States itself has been promoting. It was, uh, when you devalue a currency uh, in response to the International Monetary Fund's insistence that that will make you more competitive, what you're really devaluing is the price of your labor. There's a common price for oil and energy, a common world price for raw materials, a common world price for machinery. Uh, the only thing that really is devalued is uh, labor and uh, uh, domestic land, which of course makes it uh, uh, much cheaper for foreigners to buy uh, control of as they've done throughout Latin America. So the effect of uh, the international fund and monetary fund and the World Bank dominating the economic policy of uh, global South countries was to make them economic satellites of the United States increasingly highly indebted to the point that today uh, the uh, global South has great difficulty paying its foreign debts. And uh, that's where the US diplomacy comes in uh, and says, well, if you can't uh, pay your foreign debts and you can't borrow any more money uh, to pay them, then now you have to begin selling off your public domain, sell off your public infrastructure, sell off your land, sell off your natural resources, your oil and gas, your minerals, uh, your plantations. And essentially that's the dynamic of the United States. Uh, and its economic power does not stem from its industrial power, does not stem from industrial capitalism. It stems from finance capitalism. It stems from the fact that it financially dominates uh, these countries and maintains its financialization by its militarization, by its 800 military bases uh, around the world, starting with its two main enemies. Uh, uh, Germany has 119 mil US military bases and Japan has 120 military basis. Those are the two countries that America has uh, essentially drawn the economic surpluses of as defeated uh, countries in World War II that have now become its uh, satellites, but remain uh, its adversaries so, to the point that uh, today you're having the most visible uh, diplomatic conflict uh, between the uh, United States and Germany saying, don't buy uh, natural gas uh, from Russia. Uh, buy liquefied uh, natural gas uh, from the United States, even though it costs eight or nine uh, times more. And even though this gas will not be available because there's not enough port, uh, uh, large enough port uh, services to unload the natural gas for another three or four years, essentially America is telling Germany, you know, uh, take one on the hand, uh, take it on the head for the Alliance. It's okay, freeze in the dark, this winter. It's going to be a very cold winter. The United States has uh, uh, pressed uh, Germany not to uh, uh, open up the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia. Uh, the Ukrainians are threatening to, uh, to uh, steal the gas uh, for their own kleptocracy and use themselves because Ukraine, the Ukraine is pretty much uh, out of gas and uh, the cold winter is just coming in February and March. So you're, you're having uh, the whole fight, a diplomatic fight that appears on the surface
to be against Russia and China is actually a fight to maintain America's uh, iron curtain, uh, iron economic and military curtain, locking the NATO countries into dependency on the United States, locking uh, Japan and uh, uh, South Korea, which was later defeated, uh, into dependency on the United States, instead of letting them enrich themselves with mutual trade and investment in uh, Russia and China, respectively. Uh, the expectation when the Soviet Union dissolved and when Russia uh, agreed to dissolve it was that, okay, Russia is going to turn towards Europe and uh, German industry is going to essentially replicate itself in Russia. They will come and reorganize manufacturing in uh, uh, in Russia uh, along a much more uh, rational basis than was uh, possible under Stalinism. And uh, uh, the idea was that uh, in, in China also, uh, the Japanese like uh, the Taiwanese would be investing very heavily uh, in China and helping it modernize uh, along with, with uh, uh, the United States. Uh, the United States wanted to take a lead role in China and indeed the Wall Street firms uh, uh, especially Goldman Sachs uh, played uh, a, a very strongly influential uh, in China. And uh, uh, even today, China is looking to Wall Street to uh, uh, defend its own financial interests by opposing the American military threat uh, against China that's being done by uh, uh, the crazies. Uh, in Congress in both parties. Uh, it's the Democrats, it's the liberals, and it's the left-wingers that have always been the most anti-Russian and anti-labor uh, uh, anti parties, uh, and essentially uh, against the minorities. Surprisingly enough, we have the absurd position that Donald Trump and the Republicans are now uh, putting themselves forward as the party of industrial labor being very largely uh, white labor uh, against uh, 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 the ethnic and racial uh, minorities. Uh, and you're having uh, the Republicans, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're having the Republicans trying to, uh, at least under Trump, uh, avoid the, uh, the new Cold War conflict with Russia and China, while it's the Democrats uh, that are uh, are pushing it. Uh, Obama uh, was certainly the most vicious uh, anti-Russian cold. Oh, feel free. Okay, oh, let me get, okay, so we'll continue now? Yeah, so why don't we just continue? Okay. I have a question when the time comes. Yeah, I have some questions too. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the fight between uh, the United States and its adversaries in Europe and uh, East Asia is really over, over control of their trade policies. And it's more than that, it's the fight to impose a neoliberal economy on these countries, uh, an anti-labor economy, an economy in which the uh, center of uh, economic and social planning is shifted away from electoral politics towards the uh, financial centers, uh, with uh, the financial center uh, being in a basement of NATO, uh, basically. Uh, so finance and NATO, uh, as you can see, are controlling uh, the European diplomacy uh, to an extent that the voters certainly don't, uh, uh, don't approve of. And if you look at what the American voters want, uh, it's not what uh, the Democrats and Republican administrations are promoting. And the same thing in Europe. Uh, the European uh, voters uh, do not want uh, a military confrontation between NATO and Russia. They don't want NATO to be doing what it's doing, and yet they're all parts of NATO, and NATO That's controls their... You can join. Oh. I'll send it again. What are we doing? Oh, I can't hear you. Keep going, just keep going. Don't worry about it. It's a friend of ours. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, NATO is basically dominating uh, the European and also uh, uh, Central Central Asian foreign policy, and uh, uh, it's as if the Monroe Doctrine has been extended uh, to uh, Europe. 
And actually, there is a legal basis for this. Uh, I think that uh, lawyers in the State Department have found uh, the map of uh, ancient Gondwana land and uh, or uh, the other, uh, the northern uh, part of it. Uh, and they find that uh, in 300 million years ago, actually Europe was uh, pretty much right off uh, the Caribbean. Uh, and so when the Americans imposed the Monroe Doctrine to say that's our sphere of influence, uh, they say, well, once, you know, in the beginning, Europe uh, and uh, the Near East was part of this uh, sphere of influence. You can just look at the map of uh, uh, Pangaea, uh, it was called. That was uh, the whole world as one. And uh, we in America are one worlders. Uh, and the whole world used to be, you know, right uh, part of our control. And when we talked about the Monroe Doctrine, nobody can interfere with our uh, suzerainty over this. Uh, that really their uh, their ge geographic uh, president for all this, and uh, that somehow become a a, pri a a precedent for NATO. And uh, the idea is to maintain all of this as a sphere of influence. And America is not really a rival with China. After all, it was the United States that decided to relocate its uh, manufacturing industry, its uh, support and supplies from China. Uh, America's uh, actually allied itself with the Chinese economy. It just doesn't want anyone else to ally, them, ally themselves with the Chinese economy. Uh, America allied itself with the uh, post-Soviet economy uh, in Russia and the post-Soviet area. It was uh, the American oil companies, uh, Chevron, uh, that moved into Kazakhstan uh, to make its oil spills uh, polluting its land just as badly as uh, Chevron did in Ecuador. Uh, it was the Americans that uh, moved into uh, Russia and made the Russian stock market the darling of world stock markets between 1994 uh, in 1997. Uh, it's the Americans uh, that uh, basic, basically took uh, their position in Russia and uh, were about to buy uh, uh, Yukos uh, control of all of the Russian oil and gas from Mikhail Khodorkovsky uh, until finally uh, the uh, uh, Putin uh, stopped it. And Putin, of course, had been appointed by the Americans when they insisted that uh, uh, Yeltsin uh, and the uh, uh, kleptocrats get rid of, uh, not of uh, Primakov. When Primakov uh, uh, turned around his airplane and uh, flew back to uh, Russia when the United States uh, uh, bombed uh, Serbia to, in its support of uh, uh, the uh, Islamic uh, uh, fighters. And uh, I think it's important to realize uh, in, the, in this uh, ancient uh, Pangaea model, of Florida being right next to Libya and uh, the uh, oil producing states, uh, the Saudi uh, Wahhabi forces, uh, America's allied with ISIS and the Wahhabi as its uh, foreign legion. Uh, and it's used that its foreign legion there to fight in uh, Iraq, Syria, Libya, uh, and uh, on the uh, uh, countries to the south of Russia. The Islamic countries. And of course, it's also trying to do that in China's Western uh, Islamic uh, province, uh, the Uyghurs. Uh, and so you're, you're having uh, a kind of uh, US uh, control by, on the one hand, uh, by economically locking out with an iron trade curtain, locking out uh, Western Europe and uh, uh, American allied East Asia from uh, trade and uh, financial and monetary uh, unity uh, with uh, the emerging Russia, China, Eurasian uh, center. Uh, and on the other hand, it's still using its, its military. It, it can't use uh, American occupation uh, anymore. You can't fight a war like World War II was fought where you to control a country, you actually put your troops there uh, because there aren't any uh, democracies that are going to be able to impose a military draft to uh, raise enough troops to actually invade a country. The only tools that America has militarily are bombs, as it's uh, used in uh, the Middle East, uh, or uh, the, is the ISIS uh, Islamic uh, uh, Foreign Legion uh, to essentially destabilize and uh, do terrorism. So instead of uh, dominating through uh, manufacturing and economic power, 
uh, the American domination is the legacy of the financial power and the system that it put in place uh, at the end of uh, 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 at the end of World War II, through as I've described uh, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and my super imperialism goes uh, goes into uh, uh, how this uh, how this basically occurred. Uh, this explains why uh, China and Russia have decided that they want their prosperity to be based on exchange with the non-US West. And the uh, precondition for the austerity is to uh, de-dollarize their economy. Uh, if they realize that if uh, they keep their savings in US dollars, the only way they can keep these dollars are either deposits in American banks, which can simply be wiped out as uh, uh, occurred with Iran uh, after the Shah lost power, or mostly loans to uh, the US treasury in the form of buying treasury bills treasury bonds, treasury securities. And to the extent that they uh, support their currency against the dollar by buying, recycling the dollars by buying uh, uh, US treasury securities, they're financing the America's uh, balance of payments deficit, which is primarily a military deficit from uh, America's 800 military, big military bases uh, all around the world. And uh, the way to uh, uh, stop the tap root of this military control of the world is to de-dollarize de their economy so that uh, they don't have dollar reserves uh, to lend back to the United States to finance their own encirclement. Uh, they're uh, building up their reserves in the form of gold, uh, euros, and uh, non-dollar currencies uh, as their balance of payments grows. Uh, and uh, that uh, prevents what America had dreamt of doing, uh, obtaining all of the fruits of uh, Russian and uh, Chinese prosperity in the form of uh, debt service and profits to uh, US companies that had intended to buy out uh, their industry, their raw materials uh, with uh, dollars that then would simply be relent to the, uh, 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 to the treasury and be self-financing and a free lunch. Uh, what is, uh, solidified the American empire economically is the free lunch that it's got from the financial arrangements that I describe it in super imperialism, this recycling of the dollar uh, in, uh, back to the, uh, uh, the US treasury for uh, spending on yet further uh, military uh, bases, military spending abroad. Uh, China's investment strategy aimed at the Belt and Road and other programs uh, are based on essentially uh, a step, uh, taking a different form from America's uh, lending. America's uh, foreign uh, lending is largely you lend dollars to countries that can't afford to subsidize their chronic uh, raw materials and labor intensive trade deficits that are dictated by following US neoliberal trade theory. Uh, the Chinese don't uh, have not established uh, financial claims in the sense of a claim on uh, to grab government property wherever it can be, as you saw with Argentina and its uh, dollar-denominated debt. China is, uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative, it is uh, creating actual tangible assets, ports and roads. That's why it's called the Belt and Road Initiative. That's actually uh, uh, developing tangible accents, and that's the collateral for its, uh, uh, its foreign uh, debt. Uh, the United States is trying to uh, counter this by saying, well, we all know that the global South now cannot pay its foreign debts. Let's uh, wipe, wipe out all the government debts in these countries so that uh, these countries not owing any foreign official debt to the United States uh, and other dollar bondholders, they can free all of their foreign exchange to pay private sector bondholders, uh, the banks and the financial. And let's wipe out China's debt too. Well, China's response to this is saying, wait a minute, we didn't make the same kind of loans for the same kind of purposes uh, that the US dollar area did. Uh, we're, uh, we've uh, actually built uh, uh, the, the Belt and Road uh, projects and it's a, it are completely structurally different uh, that's part of the diplomatic fight that's going on. And uh, neoliberal economics being post-classical 
does not distinguish between productive and unproductive investment, between uh, in, uh, the kind of investment that you had in America's industrial capitalism and the kind of investment you have under finance capitalism today. And you have uh, the, the big transformation uh, that's being sponsored by the American empire is the uh, replacement of the dynamics of industrial capitalism, uh, growth in living standards, growth in productivity, expanding economies with finance capitalism, which is one of debt deflation and a rentier economy, a rentier economy being based on rent extraction, unearned income, land rent, natural resource rent, uh, and uh, monopoly rent. Uh, and that would include the financial privileges of money and credit creation uh, that you have, have in the West. So there's a completely different economic philosophy between uh, the Russia and China uh, and uh, the emerging Eurasia on the one hand, and uh, the kind of uh, economic, uh, financialized economic philosophy that you have under the finance capitalism that's being sponsored by uh, the American foreign uh, diplomacy. Uh, the foreign diplomacy of the US is privatization, uh, sell off your uh, raw materials and any rent yielding assets uh, under distressed conditions at distressed prices uh, to the American. Uh, that's not uh, primarily the aim of China uh, uh, or uh, its allied countries. It's trying to build up a, uh, a mutual uh, exchange as really the only kind of voluntary, permanent trade uh, and investment relation. And that's what uh, uh, Russia and the post-Soviet states uh, expected to happen after 1990. Well, you all know what happened. The, the first uh, result was not only an economic collapse, but a demographic collapse. Russia, uh, President Putin said that Russia lost more of its population as a result of America's neoliberal policies after 1991 than it lost in all of World War II. Well, uh, after uh, President Putin came to power, he reversed this. The population's now beginning to recover and has almost reached its uh, 1991 levels. But if you look at what's happened in uh, the former Soviet satellites, look at Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Ukraine, they've, their population is emptying out. There's uh, essentially the, uh, the US uh, sent in neoliberals to each country, privatized the economy, turned it over to uh, uh, local uh, kleptocrats that were sponsored by Wall Street essentially to uh, register the public domain, uh, whatever public assets there were that were valuable in their own names, create, a, uh, organize them as stocks. And then because there wasn't any domestic uh, money in the post-Soviet states to buy the stock, the Americans uh, and their allies came in to buy control of these uh, recently privatized uh, uh, assets, uh, most notoriously in the loans for share uh, uh, ploy that got uh, uh, in 1994 in Russia uh, that uh, privatized uh, uh, the uh, nickel nickel companies, the oil industry, uh, the what were called the seven barons uh, of uh, the seven bankers uh, that privatized this. Well, you're you're having the uh, Baltic states lose their population. They've been deindustrialized even more than the United States. Same thing in Ukraine. The Ukrainian population is emptying out, especially the education of working age. M most of the people left in Ukraine and the Baltic states are uh, the elderly who couldn't find work ab abroad. But people between uh, the ages of 20 and uh, let's say 50 have all uh, gone uh, to Europe and other areas, some to Russia, uh, to uh, obtain employment that is no longer available in their countries. So the dynamic of American empire is not the expansionist dynamic uh, that you had under uh, industrial capitalism. It's a shrinking dynamic, a predatory deflationary dynamic, uh, lowering living standards, uh, leading essentially to a kind of neo-feudalism that's being sponsored by US diplomacy. And uh, at the beginning of this uh, of my talk, Betsy Bowman said that I follow Adam Smith. What I really follow, I identify as a classical economist. It began with uh, the physiocrats, Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, 
culminating in 1848 uh, in Marxism. Marx was the uh, uh, basically the culmination of classic British political economy. And uh, when he wrote his, uh, what became the first history of economic thought, Marx's theories of surplus value, he described how the whole fight for the 19th century in Europe, the political fight, the economic fight was to uh, free economies from the residue of the feudal landlord class. The idea was to get rid of uh, the landlord class by taxing away land rent and taking the land into the public domain as a public utility, as it was for thousands of years, uh, from the late Neolithic to the Bronze Age, uh, in the books that I've published on that. Uh, and uh, Marx pointed out that uh, the definition of economic rent is to be found in classical value and price theory. Economic rent is the unearned excess of market price over actual cost value. And Marx pointed out how industrial capitalism was revolutionary. And it was revolutionary by trying to sweep away uh, the remnants of feudalism, the legacy of the landlord class and the banking class that had been a predatory banking class, not an industrial class. And Marx expected the destiny of industrial capitalism to be the free markets from the rentier classes, from the landlord class, from the natural resource owners by, and by taking natural resources back into the public domain and from the bankers by essentially financializing banking. And this seemed to be the tendency in which the whole world was moving until World War I, uh, after which uh, the whole momentum of classical economics was uh, interrupted. And we're, we've been for the last uh, uh, really 100 years in a kind of intermediate period of uh, a reaction against this uh, classical economic uh, dynamic of industrial capitalism. Well, Marx pointed out that just as uh, land rent, monopoly rent were unearned income and exploitative, uh, so uh, were industrial profits in the sense that the industrialists made profits um, and surplus value by exploiting wage labor by employing wage labor at as low a price as possible to sell the products of this labor at as high a price as possible. But uh, competition and technological advance would lead uh, one capitalist to become more productive than the others, to undersell them. And the whole race of capitalism for Marx's term was to create a, uh, uh, a race towards more efficient economies and the most efficient economies he expected uh, to win. Uh, he even endorsed free trade between England and uh, India in his speech before the Chartists, imagining that uh, trade between an industrial uh, nation such as uh, Britain would uh, industrialize uh, the colonial periphery and replicate itself in India. Well, we now know that uh, that's not how the global South uh, has developed. And uh, instead, British colonialism uh, ended up being part of uh, American financial colonialism, financial neoliberalism in underdeveloping countries instead of uh, uh, developing them. So, uh, but the dynamics that Marx described as uh, the various forms of exploitation that characterize each mode of production uh, was really the culmination of classical economics. And so the fight against Adam Smith, against uh, Ricardo, against John Stuart Mill, against Thorstein Veblen, uh, and uh, that whole century is basically a fight against uh, Marxism pushing classical economics to its logical conclusion. And uh, these are the tensions that are dividing uh, every economy in the world today. And they're also dividing uh, uh, American empire internally uh, to become the main internal strains, or as Marx put it, internal contradictions as to uh, why uh, this kind of exploitation cannot uh, win over time. Uh, but then as Rosa Luxemburg pointed out, uh, the uh, end of capitalism may not be a very uh, pretty sight. And uh, the real choice is between uh, uh, barbarism and socialism. Uh, the end of uh, industrial capitalism was expected to be socialism. All the writers of the late 19th century were writing about what kind of socialism is industrial capitalism going to evolve into? Well, in uh, 
since World War I, uh, largely under US financial uh, uh, control, it hasn't moved towards uh, socialism. It's moved back towards neo-feudalism. It's rolled, it's attempted to roll back the, the dynamic of industrial capitalism to uh, uh, de-industrialize. And that's what you see from the United States to the post-Soviet states, uh, a de-industrialization. And the uh, main economy that has picked up the dynamic of industrial capitalism evolving into socialism is the world's most successful economy, that of China. And uh, that is what is creating uh, such uh, agony within the United States today. And uh, uh, is the, the one fear uh, that US diplomacy has is that other countries will see that what's really at stake between the uh, nominal conflict between the United States and China and Russia is a conflict of economic systems. It really boils down to socialism or barbarism. And uh, that is the way in which uh, you would analyze uh, the dynamics of where the American empire is going as it's confronted with uh, the de-dollarizing uh, Eurasian uh, emergence today. That's it. May Thank you very question? much, Michael. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, it seems what, that, uh, what? Will you be able to transcribe it? Oh yes. Oh yeah, the, that's done automatically. Yeah, yeah. We'll Go get ahead. your transcription. Okay. Uh, our presidents and State Departments uh, seem to have the main job of first uh, generating enemies and then selling weapons uh, to uh, ourselves and other countries to uh, enrich the military industrial complex. Can we afford peace? Uh, what is the role of a military industrial complex uh, um, economically? Well, and, uh, and not the dynamic of uh, industrial capitalism. Uh, uh, what Marx and what everybody expected uh, the in, industrial capitalism to be about, uh, as Joseph Schumpeter pointed out, was uh, creative destruction. You would have new efficient companies come in and make uh, lower cost ways of producing steel, of producing cars, of producing others, and the low cost uh, manufacturers and the high technology uh, would drive not only old technology out of the field, but the old mode of production uh, out of field, the old rentier mode uh, out of uh, the field. Uh, military production is quite different. It's what Seymour Melman called Pentagon capitalism. And uh, Pentagon capitalism, the, uh, the contracts that the uh, military industrial complex make with the military uh, are not based on uh, competitive uh, cost reducing technology. They're mm -hmm. cost plus uh, contracts. And the idea of making, of maximizing your profit is instead of making a $20 toilet seat for the, uh, uh, for the airplanes, make a $500 toilet seat. Uh, you, and if you charge, if you make it, a, have an engineer make it for 500, then uh, you get a cost plus, let's say 10%, that's a $50 profit instead of a 50 cent profit. Uh, so you have the, the whole engineering philosophy under military, uh, uh, military industrial capitalism is to maximize the cost of production, not minimize it. So that's another reason why the American manufacturing, uh, you can see Boeing, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, making uh, its its engineers in the military uh, 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 department of Boeing uh, maximize cost and uh, uh, minimize efficiency, and you have that spilling over into all of the uh, 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 domestic uh, consumption. Well, what has uh, locked this in politically is the fact that uh, the military uh, firms have uh, created small factories to make uh, supply part, uh, suppliers and parts makers in every congr major congressional district, especially those of congressmen that are on the, uh, the Ways and Means Committee and the Financial Committee of Congress, so that uh, they can say, well, we're employing workers uh, labor in your district. If, uh, if you oppose the military industrial complex, you're being anti-labor because we're gonna have to, uh, if we don't have uh, orders, uh, we're going to have to close down this factory in your district. So uh, you have every district uh, uh, 
uh, supported by uh, the military industrial complex. And uh, needless to say, uh, the, uh, the aim of generals in the army is to go on the board of directors of these military industrial firms to get uh, the nice director's fees that they get. And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, I think the Japanese call this descent from heaven. When you go from the public sector into the uh, private sector and get uh, duly rewarded, and then you'll end up like Hillary and Bill Clinton with their own foundation, with Obama, uh, with his foundation that uh, is uh, once again going to Chicago and pushing all the black people away from uh, his property uh, in his uh, monument that he's made in Jackson Park there. Uh, you, you have uh, a whole, an entirely different dynamic from that of industrial capitalism. So By the way, I put, I'll explain that uh, all of my articles are not only on YouTube, they're on my website, michael-hudson.com. And if you go to my website, you can read uh, my articles on uh, uh, finance capitalism and its dynamics. Uh, Thank you. Uh, they're all transcribed uh, there, where I probably will be putting the transcript of this show. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question. Um, okay. It's Liz. Uh, yes, Liz. Is is the um, uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, and then the um, a, a regional comprehensive yes. economic whatever uh, it is called are 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 they going to be uh successful in any meaningful way in de-dollarizing the economies of russia We're china india right iran right well they already are successful in doing this and uh -huh. uh, the point is that members of the uh shanghai cooperation organization will hold their foreign reserves in and and denominate their trade in each other's currencies. So that's called swap arrangements. And uh, if uh, the main uh, trade between Iran and, and China is going to be the exchange of oil for manufacturers, uh, for uh, why do they need to conduct this trade in dollars? Why right. would uh, Iran ever take the chance of the American banks just grabbing them again, like uh, uh, the British uh, uh, Bank of uh, England just grabbed Venezuela's gold? You want to become immune from the Western system that is basically one of gravitization. Uh, right. Russians call it. So uh, yes, uh, they're going to uh, essentially base, be based on mutual trade and investment instead of having to somehow uh, give a uh, sponsorship fee to the United States, which is playing no role at all, except a blocking role uh, in uh, trade among the SCO countries. And how is that going to affect the value of the U.S. dollar and the, the, the standing of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency? The, the exchange rate of the dollar is always based on the balance of payments. Uh, and uh, the balance of pay, uh, payments, as I've shown in the charts in superimperialism, the entire deficit of the balance of payments in the 50s, 60s, into the early 70s, was uh, and still remains largely military in character. So if the United States cannot get other countries to uh, hold their savings and in their international central bank reserves in dollars, how is the United States going to pay for this military? Uh, it, uh, obviously, either the dollar is going to decline in price, uh, in which other countries will make, will, uh, uh, protect the uh, uh, floating tariffs against uh, mm -hmm. appreciating currencies, or the Americans will have to cut back the military spending abroad. Uh, and I think there is, uh, is going to be rising pressure in the United States to protect the value of uh, the, uh, the dollar by cutting back the military. No other country could afford this, and America's ability to afford this military spending rests entirely on its ability to make other countries pay for it not to finance it itself. That's what Americans don't understand, that it's foreign countries that are financing the, uh, the domestic US budget deficit by running a balance of payments deficit to pump dollars into foreign central banks in a circular flow. Right, thank you. Other questions, comments? 
Uh, I, could you give us your perspective on the uh, future of the United States over the next uh, 20 years and, and, and kind of what you would say uh, to your children and grandchildren, and I speak as one with gray hair, uh, and, and how they should uh, take care of themselves personally, and how to bring this down to what I believe is the collapsing United States, and to those who uh, are my friends and relatives who continue to live in the United States, of what they should do to take care of themselves. Well, there is no way in which the United States can avoid collapse without uh, canceling the debt burden that is deflating the economy. Uh, as long as it uh, has uh, so more and more of the income of uh, uh, working families paid uh, to the mortgage uh, banker, to the uh, uh, other bankers, to the credit card companies, for the health insurance uh, companies, there's no way that uh, uh, they can afford to buy goods and services. And there's no way that the United States could compete with other countries in an economy that is basically a, uh, an inefficient rentier economy. Uh, if you were to give uh, American uh, factory workers uh, all of the clothes, food, clothing, everything they consume for nothing, they, uh, with a zero wage, they still couldn't compete with uh, uh, China and uh, other countries because the money they have to pay for their apartment, uh, the money they pay for the bankers, the money they have to pay for their uh, financialized retirement fund, the money they have to pay for medical insurance is so high that uh, uh, they, they, they still couldn't compete. So uh, unless there is a radical structural transformation of the United States, uh, it's going to uh, end up looking like Latvia. Uh, so uh, what I would tell uh, uh, people looking to the future, if you want to see what the United States will look like, look at Ukraine, look at Latvia. Uh, that's our future. It's exactly the same. The dynamic that the United States has sponsored on foreign countries is the same dynamic that's in its own country, except that Latvia, Ukraine uh, don't have uh, other countries are uh, subsidizing it uh, to the extent that the United States do. So the question uh, is, uh, you already in the 1970s, people thought that the natural uh, evolution would be for American uh, technical uh, advisors, uh, technicians, middle-class labor to move to Russia as Russia uh, transformed itself uh, into a more uh, uh, efficient state. Uh, many um, American people I know have moved to China uh, Hong Kong and, and China. Uh, it looks to me like uh, just as uh, Ukraine and Latvia and Lithuania and uh, Estonia, uh, the popu young population of working age is moving uh, to these countries uh, elsewhere in order to get work. That's what's probably going to happen to uh, uh, the, Ameri the young American generation. So it helps to learn a foreign language, folks. Chinese. <laughs> Just make sure you choose the right foreign language. <laughs> Chinese, Russian. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Victor. Victor, Victor, please. Yes, um, yeah, I, that was a very interesting talk, and I'm sorry I missed some of it because of the sabotage. Um, I was wondering a little bit about the implications of, of all the changes you've spoken of in terms of the capacity of the US to impose sanctions. Because what I've read, say, in regard to Cuba, for example, is that uh, the US has such a control over all the banking systems throughout the world that it can prevent all kinds of transactions between other countries uh, at its will. And it seems to me that uh, the scenario you're describing might uh, indicate that this can be overcome somehow. Well. Uh, the, these sanctions are not against Russia and China at all. America hasn't been, uh, America has been as helpful as it can be to uh, Russia and China. The sanctions are against Europe uh, and Amer it's America's allies uh, to prevent uh, their trade uh, uh, with, with Russia. Uh, I think uh, in one of his press conferences, Pre President Putin, uh, although possibly uh, Lavrov, uh, joke uh, that they're they're hoping indeed that the United States imposes uh, sanctions, such as cutting uh, Russia and China off from SWIFT, the interbank clearing system. 
if, if they do that, uh, Russia and China have already had their uh, computer people uh, creating a parallel bank clearing system uh, to make their payments so that they have, uh, they're not part of the uh, US sponsored uh, clearing system. Uh, put in, America has a very small colony uh, in Belgium and Brussels, uh, where the head of the, uh, uh, the European uh, 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 community is. And uh, Russia has, uh, has said they're not even going to negotiate with Brussels because that just uh, Brussels takes its orders directly from the United States. And if the, the Americans tell Brussels, uh, cut the Europeans off from uh, contact uh, with uh, Russia and China, then there's no way the Germans can pay uh, Russia for its oil and gas because how do they send something from their bank to the Russian bank? Well, uh, the Russians are quite happy to, uh, uh, it'll, it'll cause maybe uh, a month or two uh, interruption in smooth banking operations. But uh, this uh, will essentially, this iron financial curtain that America is threatening uh, of imposing by uh, uh, not letting uh, other countries part of the SWIFT uh, bank clearing system, that will help solidify their system alone. I think I remember President Putin did thank Russia for its agricultural sanctions against it because uh, uh, the sanctions served as protective tariffs for Russia so that it can make its own cheese uh, and not have to import any of the cheese from uh, Lithuania anymore as it had been. It could make its own agricultural products and uh, the American sanctions have helped protect uh, and uh, Russian agriculture to the point that Russia is now the world's largest grain exporter. Uh, it doesn't need uh, American grain. So the function of American sanctions, uh, it's as if uh, Donald Trump was indeed an agent, a paid agent of Russia by saying, we're going to impose sanctions. If Russia uh, has followed neoliberalism to such an embarrassing extent that it's um, uh, impairing its own development, we're gonna help Russia socialize by imposing sanctions to force it to really go it alone and develop its own state-sponsored uh, industry. And uh, uh, same thing with China. The sanctions uh, against China have helped China become uh, independent of the American ability to create supply shortages and uh, in supply interruptions uh, of its industry uh, by uh, blocking uh, trade by American satellites uh, with China and Russia. So uh, the sanctions are highly beneficial uh, uh, to Russia and China, uh, highly injurious to America's allies. And as I said, America's enemy has always been its allies. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking more specifically about uh, the effectiveness of the sanctions against Cuba and Venezuela. Right. Uh, that is uh, the effect uh, of the sanctions against Cuba and Venezuela uh, have hurt, uh, especially once the uh, after the Soviet Union fell, uh, they had been paying uh, Russia 29 cents a pound for sugar and the uh, international price of sugar fell to about one cent a pound. Uh, that uh, could have helped Russia shift away from growing sugar to growing its own vegetables. Unfortunately, uh, Cuba, uh, Cuba didn't do this. It continued to uh, import its uh, vegetables from uh, other Caribbean countries. Uh, and uh, just it suffered very strongly under the sanctions instead of its uh, adjusting its economy to it. Right now, the sanctions uh, are driving uh, Venezuela and Cuba uh, much more tightly into the Eurasian orbit. Uh, and if they do that successfully, uh, the Eurasian orbit will expand uh, through these countries through uh, the rest of Latin America. Thank you. Thank you. What's the answer you're expecting, I bet. Uh, you know, I because what I'd read was about the extraordinary reach of the U.S. in preventing transactions uh, under uh, the undertaken by Cuba and Venezuela. Yes, and, yeah, but the, what's it preventing? Uh, you, the press says it's preventing. When you say preventing transactions with Venezuela and Cuba, these are transactions of other countries with it. So the sanctions are really against these other countries. America has uh, no ability to force Russia, China or other Eurasian countries to impose their sanctions because they're not part of NATO. They're not part of the American system. So America is consolidating the rest of the world as an independent economic and financial and industrial and military entity apart from it. America is isolating itself 
It's not, it, the end result isn't to isolate China and Russia, it's to isolate the United States from its own allies in Europe and East Asia. Thank you. Yeah. The US is going to isolate itself. Let me just prevent the phone from ringing. More, uh, are there other questions for Michael? Hello. Yeah. Hi, I, I, I'm doing an interview now. Uh, could you go back in a half an hour? Okay, thanks. Hey, Betsy. Yeah. Hi, Peg. Hi. Hi. Which I would love to hear him talk a little bit more about how the United States, Michael, is isolating ourselves. That went just a slightly over my head. Okay. If you don't mind, just to you know, bring it down just a little, help me get that. It sounds really, really important. Did you hear the question, Michael? Yeah. We'll take the uh, fight uh, by uh, the United States against Germany not to import uh, Russian gas. There's a whole division of uh, German politics now uh, that say, wait a minute, we're going to freeze when our pipes freeze because our homes are uh, filled with gas. Then uh, there's going to the, the piping will burst. We're going to have to rebuild all the walls, put in new piping. Why? Why should we freeze without uh, gas uh, and without uh, the gas to make fertilizer uh, to increase our farm output? Just because the United States uh, wants to uh, us to trade with it and not Russia. Uh, do we really want to pay? Uh, uh, eight to 10 times as high a price for uh, gas and oil uh, as we pay Russia. Well, uh, we know that America is uh, throwing all of its support behind Russia in this against Germany because uh, the sanctions have forced uh, the gas prices to go way up. So Russia's uh, making a killing on selling gas at the uh, uh, current uh, spot price instead of the long-term uh, supply price. So uh, the sanctions uh, are, uh, are helping Russia very strongly at the expense of Europe uh, in the vain hope that somehow Europe is going to end up saying, okay, we're going to uh, remain uh, letting our uh, government be run by NATO uh, and by uh, Wall Street uh, instead of by our own elected officials. And we're going to let our polit politicians uh, continue to be uh, uh, the ones that the United States is promoting, not our own. We're going to make these sacrifices. Uh, and uh, the Baltic countries will say, yes, we're, going, uh, we're willing to leave our countries, not to uh, work in uh, uh, the Baltics anymore, uh, but abroad uh, in order that the United States can have uh, the kind of uh, military uh, adversary uh, uh, to Russia that it's uh, promoting. Uh, uh, the question is how long can other countries be willing to let uh, American uh, interests be uh, stronger than their own economic interests? Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, discussion? Mm -hmm. Michael has very graciously stayed on longer than uh, usual. Um, now it's my phone. Yeah, it's a cool thing. Oh, time's up. Sally, this is someone who was trying to get online. Uh, he can he can ask question to you and you can ask him. Betsy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's not fixed, right? Yeah, it is. It's you should be able to get on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sally. To the uh, microphone. She can answer the I've been taken off. I've been blocked or something. Like that. I I don't know, Sally. I think we're going to end the webinar now anyway, so you can watch it on, uh, on, uh, from, you know, later from the webpage. Yes. Um, well, I guess, uh, Cliff, do you have any questions? Um, there are other, a lot of other people I can see. So I think we should thank, uh, Michael Hudson for um, for 
helping us get th through for this wonderful presentation uh, in spite of the uh, disruption that mm -hmm. is very upsetting. And uh, we'll have to figure out how to avoid that in the future. Um, and uh, I thank everyone who has uh, contributed to the discussion. Today's webinar, as well as all of our past programs, are available on YouTube and they're accessible from our website, globaljusticecenter.org. Um, next week, we will, next Monday, we will be having another webinar. Thank you. Resisting State Violence with Joy James, a, um, a radical philosopher. Uh, we invite you all to join us next Monday at the same time, one o'clock central time. And uh, I wanna thank our webinar team, Liz Mestres, Gregory Diamond, Roberto Robles, Olivia Canales, Cliff Durand, and I'm Betsy Bowman, and I'll sign off until next week. And I want to thank everyone for participating. And I want to thank Michael, especially for participating and bearing with us through uh, our, our first uh, hacking experience. And um, uh, 